I hope you all enjoyed your breakfast. <clears throat> we are fortunate to have Victoria Huggins with us today. Victoria first became interested in Alzheimer's because of her grandfather, Charles Tucker Huggins, who suffered from Alzheimer's. Her passion for the Alzheimer's disease awareness and music therapy captured the attention of local and national leadership, including Fox News and People Magazine, nurturing relationships that were cultivated as Miss North Carolina Victoria has served as a keynote speaker in Alzheimer's and dementia conferences across the state of North Carolina, including the launch of North, North Carolina Brain Health Registry in conjunction with Duke University's Bryan Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. Because of her history, and passion for working with Alzheimer's, Victoria just recently accepted the position of manager for the Walks to End Alzheimer's for the Eastern North Carolina chapter. I am proud to present Victoria. Oh, thank you. Well, good morning, Pilot International. Oh, it is such a joy and an honor to be here with all of you today. I don't know about all of you, but it was so nice to put on a dress, to put on makeup, to put on my heels and actually hug somebody and not have to worry about mask me. Has anybody else had that problem during COVID? Ooh, Lord have mercy. We have made it. So I know that you are probably enjoying digesting that wonderful breakfast that we just enjoyed. Let's give a hand to all of the people here at the Marriott for that wonderful breakfast. So now I'm going to invite you because you probably need to let that set a little more. Stand up, please. Oh yes, I am not your typical speaker, as if you couldn't already tell that. Now I want you to look at the person to your left and I want you to say, you look fabulous today. And then I want you to give your neighbor a hug because my last name is Huggins and we need to hug a little bit. Yes, very nice. <laughs> All right, after you hug and give your compliment, you can sit back down. <laughs> Don't you feel good now? I tell you what, God certainly has a good sense of humor because my last name is Huggins and I love to hug. So I think that that's pretty coincidental. But it is such a joy and an honor to be here with all of you today. Where are my North Carolina people, my North Carolina chapter? Make some noise, Tar Heels! <laughs> Fantastic. I had the wonderful opportunity to get to meet the North Carolina chapter of Pilot International a few years ago, and I am so tickled to death that because of that opportunity and nurturing that relationship, now I am here with all of you in Atlanta, Georgia for the Pilot International Women's Convention. It's pretty amazing. So thank you so much for the warm welcome. Thank you to Miss Peggy and Judy and everyone for coordinating me being here. And of course, my wonderful mama for being my sidekick. Everybody say hi, Beverly. <laughs> so that's my mama. She couldn't deny me if she tried. We look just alike. But yes, my passion is for Alzheimer's disease research advocacy and being a voice for those who suffer from this disease in addition to their families. The way that I became introduced to this terrible disease was I love to sing. That is my number one passion in the entire world is because music has this fantastic quality that no matter where we are, who we are, what we grew up with, it transcends all of that and it connects us together. So when I would go with my little karaoke machine and my parents would take me to nursing facilities and I would go and I would sing. I would sing everything from Amazing Grace to At Last. 
And I would love getting to see all of the different reactions because I always joke and say that my favorite audience members are senior citizens and children because you know immediately if they like you or if they don't. There is no in-between, no political correctness. You're either in or you're out, as Heidi Klum usually says on Project Runway. But the Alzheimer's patients were my favorite, and I immediately gravitated towards them because I would hear stories ahead of time, being an eight-year-old child, where some of the caregivers would come up to me and say, now, Victoria, Miss Rosie has Alzheimer's disease. Do not be offended if she looks confused, if she doesn't interact with you normally, or if she's not able to recognize her husband who is sitting beside her in the wheelchair. But as I began singing, at last, Miss Rosie perked up in the wheelchair. She started singing every word. She reached her hand to the husband she had not been able to recognize for six months and took his hand in hers and looked at him with conviction in her eyes and said, honey, that's our song. That's when I knew that this was my project, this was my passion. And Miss Rosie, for just a few moments in time, was able to remember her Charlie once again. And that, in my opinion, is priceless. I do want to take a moment to recognize another young lady who is responsible for me being here today, and that is North Carolina pilot, Ann Martin. She followed my journey since I was a little girl singing and performing on the Alabama Theater stage in South Carolina, all the way to the moment I was crowned Miss NC. And I got a message from her on Facebook when I was in Aberdeen, North Carolina, making an appearance one day during my reign as Miss North Carolina 2017. And she said, if you just have a moment, we're having our state convention just down the road, 10 minutes exactly from where you're at. Can you just pop your head in? So I looked at my mama and my daddy, who I was so fortunate to have with me that day, and I said, okay, Miss Ann asked me to pop my head in. Let's wheel the Dunn Benson Ford into the parking lot, pop the head on with the crown. And as you can see in that top picture, she was elated. And she said, can you just pop your head into the actual conference? And knowing Miss Ann, you, there wasn't really a no in the book when it came to her. So I said, yes, ma'am, I'll be happy to. I stuck my head in. Applause came from the entire room. And I was like, well, I better put my whole body up in here and say hello, everybody. And surely I did. And one thing led to another. The next year, I was the guest speaker for the state convention, and then now I'm here. So unfortunately, Anne passed away earlier this year, but I know that she's with us and that she's looking down today and that I hope that I make her proud. So I'm going to do this presentation in honor of her today. So here's my first slide. As you can see, we're not going to do death by PowerPoint today. I hate that. I'm a master's degree student getting my master's in business administration in, uh, at the University of North Carolina at Pembroke. And I hate it when my professors go, we are going to be talking about such and such today and reading every single line that I am perfectly capable of reading for myself on the PowerPoint presentation and there's no personality. So we're going to have some personality today. So if you didn't read that title slide and think, getting to know you, getting to know all about you, are you thinking it now? 
Okay, cool. So we can totally be friends now. <laughs> but as she shared with you, I am so honored to be in this new position with the Alzheimer's Association, Eastern North Carolina chapter, and I am overseeing two walks this year, Moore County and Fayetteville, which is kind of funny because at first I began my journey with the Alzheimer's Association as a teenager, volunteering for the Fayetteville walk, driving the golf cart, getting people who were participating from the parking lot to the actual walk area. Now, I got to talk to pretty much everybody that came to the walk. So I guess that they gave me the right position because I can talk to a tree. I never, you know, have any trouble talking with anybody. But since that moment, I have raised over $50,000 for the Alzheimer's Association. And I'm very grateful to have been able to achieve that with the help of so many wonderful people just like you who have heard my story and heard my passion and connected with it. Now, when you think about memories, I want you to go ahead and close your eyes and I want you to think about your very favorite memory. What pops into your head? Is it something from your childhood? Is it a smell of maybe your mama cooking? Maybe it's the sound of your daddy praying. Maybe it's an experience that you had. Maybe it's a person that you love. Those memories, you can open your eyes. No matter what you're going through, no matter where you are, those memories can help you during your day so that you can be your very best because ultimately your memories help make you who you are. And without those memories, who would you be? So what would you do to protect your memories? And why is it so important right now in 2021 to protect your memories? So I'm going to show you a clip of a memory that I never want to forget. My friends in the technical booth, if you'll press play for me. The year is 2017. The field has narrowed down from 45 eligible candidates from across the state of North Carolina. I don't think you can hear the audio very well, so I'll narrate for you. So that's me, Miss Greater Sampson County, and Miss Mal Holly Allison Ferris. This is my fifth and final year to compete for the honor of Miss North Carolina. We're standing in anticipation. The MC decides to pull a fastball and come over and talk to us in the middle of the most tense moment of our lives. Miss Greater Sampson County, Victoria Huggins! And the crowd goes wild. Thank God she finally won. She won't ever compete again after five times. Thank God this girl finally won this thing. There's my executive director. She's telling me, don't cover your face. My cuff gets caught, and I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. There's my teen, Marissa Garrison. Fun fact, she's now a Dallas Cowboys cheerleader. Very prestigious. There I am. Oh, no, I'm not supposed to cover my face. Okay, I'm going to praise God instead. There's the roses. Okay, yes, yes, ma'am, I won't cover my face. Okay, so we got to go down here. Oh, okay. All right, I'm living this. Oh, now we hug. Okay, cool. This is awesome. Is this real? They're not pulling a Steve Harvey right now. There goes the crown. Oh, praise Jesus. That wonderful crown represents $30,000 in scholarships, a car for the year, an apartment in Raleigh, and the opportunity to go to Miss America for the national competition and to serve the state of North Carolina as the 80th 
Miss North Carolina, the Pearl Girl. Thank you. And then when people ask me, what's pageants really like? Watch this. Those are some of my best friends. I am so grateful that those women are not like what you hear about in toddlers and tiaras. It was a real life Miss Congeniality. And I got to be Sandra Bullock for a year. So that was really awesome. But anyway, and there I am in the reflection recording my crowning moment in not the most flattering lighting, but it's okay. So I am thrilled that I get to have that experience now forever in my life and in my memory. And it's like I tell my mom, I have that memory by watching that video, but nobody gets to see the video of from my perspective of what it was like in that moment when my name was called and I dropped to the floor and I got to see my mama crying and my daddy jumping up and down in his military uniform and the five committees that helped get me there being so happy and seeing the looks on everyone's faces. I have to really think about that and preserve that memory in my head because only I have that perspective and I'm not able to share that with anyone other than just me speaking about it. So one of the things about Alzheimer's disease that is a common misconception is that it's a completely and totally separate thing from dementia and that is not the case. So it's a wide umbrella term, dementia is, and Alzheimer's disease is the most common form of dementia. And it actually is the precursor, basically, for all forms of dementia. So if you see there, about 50 to 75% of dementia patients have Alzheimer's disease, followed by some of the other more common forms of dementia that you've heard about recently. Now with Alzheimer's, what makes it separate from all of the other different forms of dementia is that it actually causes problems with memory. It also causes issues with thinking and being able to express yourself in the way that you would like to do in your personality. It also affects your behavior. So many times with this disease, it's very unfortunate that you have someone, perhaps like me, who has a very bubbly, outgoing personality and this disease tragically turns them into a completely separate personality, polar opposite of what you would normally expect for that person to deliver. Now, these symptoms actually develop slowly. And newest research actually shows that Alzheimer's disease can actually begin 12 years before it is even noticed from the outward perspective. Because it is so silent, because it is so... Oh, you just don't even realize what's happening until it's not just mom's forgetting her keys. It's not just that she's acting a little bit off. Maybe she's not wanting to go to church like she normally did before. Maybe she's not interacting with her husband in the same way or like, oh, did I forget to tell you that? So you always have to stay on the lookout for these different signs because the earliest detection is always the best because of the different opportunities that are available earlier on as opposed to later on in the progression of the disease. So these are some 2021 facts and figures that I wanted to share with you. And it's in a video, and then we're going to talk about some of the most important statistics that we have uncovered in 2021. I think I clicked too far. Ugh. I'll let y'all press play. There you go. Maybe, possibly. There we go.
All right, so let's break that down as far as what we just saw. Now in that time of seeing that presentation, which was just over a minute long, the latest figures for Alzheimer's disease is that in that time frame of just watching that video, one person in the United States has developed Alzheimer's disease. They could be right here in this room. They could be in your state that you represent. But one person has already developed the disease. Now, also with 2021, we learned a lot in 2020. It was definitely a transformative year, not only for Alzheimer's disease research, but it was also a transformative year as a society because it turned our attention towards things that we needed to be paying more attention to. So with that enlightenment, the Alzheimer's Association wanted to study specifically how the COVID-19 pandemic was affecting people who suffer from Alzheimer's disease. And as you saw in that video, 16% of deaths increased in Alzheimer's patients during the COVID-19 pandemic. In addition to that, we also learned and had a conversation about race and how people of different minorities felt about Alzheimer's research and receiving care when it comes to Alzheimer's disease and dementia. And as you saw, there are a lot of different people from different backgrounds that feel that maybe if they do become diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, that perhaps they wouldn't have the same treatment as other races or other ethnicities, which is very sad. So the Alzheimer's disease has actually, cre er, the Alzheimer's Association rather, has created a new diversity and inclusion initiative to be able to ensure that everyone, regardless of where they come from and their ethnic background, that they receive the same care and the same level of treatment, no matter what. And the thing is about Alzheimer's, there is no prevention. There is no cure. So with my grandfather, when he was diagnosed with cancer, we had options. We had hope. We knew that if we did the chemotherapy, if we did the radiation, there was this wonderful percentage that he could recover and be healthy again. But when the diagnosis comes to your family of Alzheimer's disease, that is not the case. You don't have those options available other than treatment, which we're going to talk about. As of this morning, there has never been a survivor of Alzheimer's disease. And that is the goal, that we get that white flower and that first survivor in our midst. Thank you. So how prevalent is this disease? So one in three seniors will develop Alzheimer's disease. So if you have someone in your life that's over 65 years old, if you get them a group within a group with two of their best friends, it is likely statistically that one of those three friends is going to develop Alzheimer's disease. This is the fact that really blows my mind because breast cancer has affected my family with my mom. So Alzheimer's disease actually kills more than breast cancer and prostate cancer combined. How mind-blowing is that? Now between 2000 and 2019, deaths from heart disease have actually decreased, which is a blessing because heart disease is the number one killer of Americans in our nation. They've decreased 7.3%, but deaths from Alzheimer's disease have increased 145%. It's a crisis in America. It is the fifth leading cause of death. We have just cracked the top five, and that's not a top five I want to be a part of. Among 65 and older senior citizens, it is the fifth leading cause. It is also the leading cause, number one, of disability and poor health in our senior citizens. And unfortunately, on the national scale, when you look at all of the different causes of death, no matter the age, 
Alzheimer's disease comes in at number six. Two years ago, it was number eight. In two years, it moved up two spots. Currently, right now, 6.2 million Americans are suffering from Alzheimer's disease. But according to researchers, that's not even an accurate statistic because most of the times the formal diagnosis for Alzheimer's disease does not come until after their loved one has passed away and they're able to see the tangles and the tau proteins and the amyloid plaque on the brain. By 2050, this number is projected to rise to 12.7 million people diagnosed with this disease. That's why we've got to do something about it now, because we need to protect not only us who was in this room, but also all of the next generation. In 2021, Alzheimer's and other dementias are going to cost the nation $355 billion. That's a lot. Can you imagine how many shoes that I could buy with that amount? <laughs> Had to lighten the mood a little bit. I don't want to be too somber here. But $355 billion for this nation to pay and cover these costs. By 2050, though, the costs are going to rise as high, according to the latest projections, to $1.1 trillion for our nation to be able to take care of our senior citizens with Alzheimer's. Now, that does not even include the millions of hours of unpaid care that our caregivers, usually the wife, the husband, the daughter, or the son, gives to their loved one who has suffered from this disease. And the disease can take anywhere from 5 to 25 years until the ultimate death occurs. And one, over 11 million people are providing that unpaid care right now. So we've got to take care of our caregivers because if we don't take care of the caregivers, we can't properly take care of those suffering from this disease. Now why it's important for us to talk about today at the Pilot International Club. This is our disease for women. We are two times more likely to develop Alzheimer's disease than men. Now is that because we can handle so many more complexities than men? I don't know. Is it because women are from Venus and men are from Mars? I don't know. Are women more able to multitask and men are compartmentalized? I don't know. That hasn't been officially scientifically diagnosed. However, we women have a lot on our plates. And that is my hypothesis as far as why it is more likely for women to develop this disease. And it is six times more likely for women to step up and be the caregiver than men. So that is why we women have to band together. And I'm very proud that some of the leading scientists and researchers right now in Alzheimer's disease are women. So girl power, men, that are in the room, God bless you. Thank you for what you do. You are important, but, you know, I got to give a little bit of some, you know, uh, 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 for my girls here, right? <sighs> all right, now we reach the good part of the program. Now that we have talked about all of the sadness and the devastation of this disease, what are we doing about it? How are we going to combat Alzheimer's disease and all of this sorrow and all of this devastation? Well, luckily, the Alzheimer's Association is here to help. Now, the mission of the Alzheimer's Association, they are actually the leading nonprofit in the entire world dedicated to the mission of ending Alzheimer's disease. If you're wondering why I'm wearing purple, yes, it is my favorite color, but it is also the official awareness color for Alzheimer's disease. So from my table right here, y'all wearing purple, yes, you go. 
Now, do you have on purple socks or something, sir? No, you don't? Well, we can fix that before lunch. We can surely go over to market and find you something purple. But <laughs> I had to tease you. You're doing so good. He's just smiling at me, and now I've thoroughly embarrassed him. But the mission of the Alzheimer's Association has been going strong for decades. And it's the hashtag end alls that is our primary motivator. And our vision is a world without Alzheimer's. And we will not stop until that vision comes true. Now, there is a variety. Oh, thank you so much to my table right over here, Midways. So there are a lot of different resources and opportunities that are available with the Alzheimer's Association that are so vital and so important to providing that support to the caregivers in addition to the people who are suffering from the disease. One of my favorite things that they actually do is they have support groups across the entire nation and in different communities in different states where caregivers can have an opportunity to go once a month and be able to be surrounded surrounded with people who are just like them, who are currently caring for someone that they love who is suffering from Alzheimer's disease. So that caregiver support network and having those caregiver meetings is so vital to being able to make those caregivers feel heard, feel seen, that they are not alone in this fight. In addition to that, through the website, there is a whole resource portal where you can be connected if you do not already have a neurologist or an Alzheimer's specialist to take care of your person that you love who is suffering from the disease. They have an entire address book of people that they recommend and specialists and medical professionals that you can consult for your loved one. Now, the most important thing about this that I want to highlight significantly is that 1-800 number that is on that screen. I love this resource because you can call that number 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and someone from the Alzheimer's Association who is familiar with this disease will be there to speak with you. And it doesn't matter if you need to vent to someone. It doesn't matter if it's a question of, I cannot get mom in the shower to save my life. What can I do to help her to bathe? There will be someone with compassion, first and foremost, and secondly, with the knowledge to be able to enable you to accomplish that task through that 1-800 number. So I hope that you will write that down, take a picture of it, because that is my favorite resource that the Alzheimer's Association has to be able to care for people in the field who are actually living with this disease. Now, how do we stop it? How can we work together to stop this? Not just on an association level, but as a community, as a state, and as a nation. The good news is that there is hope. And that is the number one thing, that at least we have hope. And we also have a lot of different things going on right now with advocacy and working with our state and our national representatives on a federal level. Congress has been approving significantly over the past several years to be able to provide the funding needed to be able to continue research and continue to provide this care for our Americans suffering with Alzheimer's. Now, last month, was it a God wink? I think so. In honor of Brain Health Awareness Month, the FDA approved a brand new drug to be an effective treatment for Alzheimer's disease. Yes. So Adacunab has received that federal approval and it is the first FDA approved treatment for Alzheimer's disease that actually delays the decline from Alzheimer's. Now, why is this significant? Because this is actually the first treatment that has been federally approved for Alzheimer's disease since 2003. Almost two decades we haven't had anything new come about. So how amazing that 2021 is the year. 
And it is the first treatment to actually address the underlying biology of what makes Alzheimer's disease progress. Now, what is that? So the substantial evidence has actually shown in the latest Alzheimer's disease research that actually that protein and those tangles that we have been looking at and trying to figure out over the past several decades do have a significant reasoning as to why Alzheimer's progresses in the way that it does, and that's the amyloid plaque. And as those tangles and that plaque spreads in the brain, that causes those memory, behavioral, and other dysfunctions that cause Alzheimer's disease to be formally diagnosed. The reduction in the plaque is actually what um, Adulaham, which that's kind of the common name for it instead of the other one because it's kind of a mouthful. But aduhalem actually addresses the plaque. So if you address the plaque, then that can provide vital time. Because can you put a price tag on time? I don't think so. Being able to provide this as a treatment for early stage cognitive impairment patients. So unfortunately, it is not available and not given as a treatment to those in the later stages of Alzheimer's disease yet. But for those who are experiencing the beginning phases and receiving that mild cognitive impairment, this is a godsend. It's given intravenously, so it's just like when my mom goes and gets her, um, what do you call that again, Mama? I lost you. Where are you, Mom? Oh, maybe she left me. I don't know. But she goes in and gets an infusion to help build up her immune system so that that way she can continue fighting off different things that are attacking her body since she is two years breast cancer free, which I am very grateful for, but she still goes. Thank you. She still goes and gets her prolia every six months, and that is what they are basically recommending for this new treatment for Alzheimer's disease, is that that intravenous solution will be able to be administered every six months to be able to help, and they have seen significant improvement within all of the clinical trial participants. So we are very grateful for the FDA for approving this so that there is that hope. Now here's one of my favorite ladies, Dr. Kathleen Welsh Bomer. I have to give her a shout out because she is from North Carolina and she is the leading research for all, researcher for Alzheimer's disease in North Carolina. She is over the Duke University Brain Bank. And if you have never been, I highly recommend that you go there or either in your own state, there are several different research facilities that you can call the different researchers and medical professionals and you can actually set up a tour or a meeting, or you can have them come and speak to your pilot group in your individual chapter, and they can share with you what they're doing in your state to address Alzheimer's disease. And she focuses on this biological basis, and she recommends a doula helm, so because she does, I trust her completely. So that is why I am so thrilled that we have this. So you know we were talking about the amyloid plaque. What does it look like? So if you look underneath a microscope, this is what you see. So if you see right there, there are those little plaques that are all clustered together. That is the amyloid plaque. And basically, if you look a little closer in the center, that's what a normal neuron in your brain is supposed to look like. But when this plaque becomes involved with your brain and comes in contact with your neurons, it starts those tangles that you see over there on the right-hand side. And as it continues to develop, this plaque takes over. And no longer is there a smooth surface on your brain, but rather there's all of this gunk basically impeding your pathways to be able to connect. Now, if you look on this brain scan for the PET scan, this is a specialized scan. This is actually one of the newer innovations in science where it actually monitors the amyloid plaque levels when you take this scan. So over on the right hand side, that is a normal brain scan. That is how it's supposed to look like. That beautiful green and blue. Huh, those are pilot colors, how about that? Then in the middle, 
this is when it starts actually showing up. So this is before the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, but the amyloid plaque is starting to appear. And then on the far left side, that is an Alzheimer's brain. That is what it looks like. That is how the plaque takes over with that fiery red, and you see a lot less blue, don't you? This is the part that broke my heart when I went to go see Dr. Kathy at the Duke Brain Bank. Now this is a photo representation. When I was in person at the brain bank, she actually took out one of the preserved brains that she studies for research. And it was a healthy brain. And then she took out of the brain bank an Alzheimer's brain. And she allowed me to observe it. And it was so sad to see the difference in the size the difference in the color, how everything is just shriveled up and shrunk together. That's what it actually does to your brain. So there I am visiting the Brian Alzheimer's Research Facility. And like I said, you can go and you can research in your own state because they're everywhere across the United States. And if you need an opportunity or a resource to be able to find out where they are, you can go onto the Alzheimer's Association website, alz.org, and look it up in your state so that you can visit and educate yourself. So we are very grateful that Dr. Kathleen actually launched the Brain Health Registry in North Carolina. Now, I was naive. I thought that if I registered as an organ donor, that if I so chose, that I could donate my brain to scientific research. That is not the case. It is a completely separate registration form. Now, with the Brain Health Registry in North Carolina, I am one of the first people to sign up. So I receive information on different clinical trials, different innovations in research. If I want to participate, I can. In addition to, I have given the right that if I pass away, that they can use my brain for scientific research. They need to have female brains because they have a severe lack of female brains. Dr. Kathleen educated me on that, that it's a lot harder for men to give the consent for their wife's brain because they feel like that's an invasion of the temple, whereas females are more likely to give the consent to their husband's brain for scientific research because <laughs> <laughs> this is straight from the researcher's mouth because they understand and put it into perspective that we need it for science. We need to understand it. <laughs> so <laughs> I highly recommend to have that conversation with your husband, have that conversation with your wife, so that if this is something that you want to do, that y'all will be completely on the same page about that so that Dr. Kathy doesn't have this situation in the future. <laughs> I'm glad y'all like to laugh, but you can look again on the Alzheimer's Association website and see if you have a brain health wet registry in your state. Now, this right here is my friend Jay Reinstein. He was the former assistant city manager for the city of Fayetteville, North Carolina, which is near where I grew up. Now, I'm going to let him speak for himself here in this video, because when you look at Jay, you see a healthy, excited, wonderful speaker who is very accomplished in life. But in his 50s, he received some terrible news. He had early onset Alzheimer's disease. My name is Jay Reinstein. I'm from Raleigh, North Carolina. At the age of 57, I was diagnosed with younger onset Alzheimer's disease. I never knew you could get Alzheimer's at such an early age. I was a public servant working as an assistant city manager in Fayetteville, North Carolina. And I thought, my gosh, this diagnosis ended my career. What was gonna happen to my finances? I wasn't sure. I was married, 
I had three children, four grandchildren. Was I ever going to see my grandchildren get older? Was I ever going to see my daughter get married? And would I be a burden to my family with this disease? It scared the heck out of me. And rather than focusing on those things that I couldn't do with this diagnosis, I made sure that I began to live my life focusing on those things that I could do. I continue to stay involved in the community. I got involved with the Alzheimer's Association, began to uh, put a team together for the Alzheimer's Walks, and my jaywalkers were able to raise $80,000 in three years. I was able to become a member of the National Alzheimer's Association Board of Directors. I'm involved, I do a radio show. I may not be able to read a book because I have difficulty with reading retention, and I may have trouble with my short-term memory, but I try to focus on those things that I can do well. So I try to live life. But I would also say that while I do everything I can to stay positive, there's still no cure for this disease. There's no treatment for this disease. The medications that are available, like I take, address the symptoms. What we need is more dollars for research so that one day we can find that treatment or a cure. So one day, no one is living with this horrific disease, Alzheimer's. Again, we need to find a cure. Thank you so much. Now, some exciting news is that Jay is actually eligible for a doula helm, and he is working with his insurance so that he can be one of the first people in North Carolina to receive this incredible treatment that the FDA just approved. We love you, Jay. He's kind of awesome. My name is but as he was sharing, we do need your help. And there are four ways that you can help the Alzheimer's Association to end Alzheimer's and to have that vision be fulfilled for a world without Alzheimer's and all other dementias. Now, we're going to talk in just a minute about Walk to End Alzheimer's because that's kind of what I do. And then there's also AIM, which is our Alzheimer's impact movement, where our different ambassadors and volunteers actually go to Capitol Hill in their state, as well as on the national level to speak with our national representatives to share why Alzheimer's is important and share their personal stories. You can also volunteer for a clinical trial. They need healthy brains. They need brains of all ages to be able to help them better understand, because we've learned so much, but we still have a long way to go. And another really impactful way that you can do this and make a difference is through making a donation because it is so imperative that we have this funding to be able to have more research. Now, the Walks to End Alzheimer's. How many of you have ever heard of the Walk to End Alzheimer's? Oh, that's fantastic. Y'all are so smart. So the Walks to End Alzheimer's are amazing. They are an uplifting event where people from every walk of life comes together for this event. Now there are over 600 Walks to End Alzheimer's across the entire nation. I'm over two of them, Moore County and Fayetteville. Now you can look on the website, just like I was sharing with you, and see where your local Walked In Alzheimer's is so that you can get involved. And basically the core element of the Walked In Alzheimer's is number one, to show Alzheimer's families that they are not alone in the fight, that there are all of these people who will be willing to wear their purple and come out in a strong force to show that they're committed to this cause. So you can actually go to this section of the website, alz.org forward slash walk, and you can put in your zip code or your state, and it'll show you all of the different walks that are in your state and available for you to be a part of. So you can sign up for a team. You can fundraise. You can be a sponsor. So there are three different ways right there that you can become involved with either your business or on an individual level. Now, my favorite element of the Alzheimer's, walked in Alzheimer's, is actually the promise garden. So as you can see, all of those beautiful pinwheel flowers in that photo that I included on this slide... Well, each color actually represents something. And as you register and get in there with your team, you actually pick up 
the flower that corresponds with why you are passionate for Alzheimer's disease. So if you are like me and you don't have a personal connection to the cause, but you want to see a world without Alzheimer's disease, you will pick up the orange flower at your walk to end Alzheimer's. If you are living with the disease, you will pick up the blue flower. If you have lost someone to Alzheimer's disease, you will pick up the purple flower. And if you are a caregiver for someone suffering from Alzheimer's disease, you will pick up the yellow flower. And you carry those flowers with you as you walk, and then you plant them in the promise garden for your community to observe throughout the next week after the walk. So it's very symbolic, it's very impactful, especially during the opening ceremony when you're reading out what the different colors mean and you ask them to raise their flower. It is so beautiful to see all of the different ones that are raised for these different reasons. Now you can also create a unique activity or event in your state or in your community. So before I worked full-time for the Alzheimer's Association, I worked for the Fayetteville Woodpeckers minor league baseball team, Class A advanced affiliate of the Houston Astros. Where's my Texas chapter? Texas? Texas! Everybody says that I'm from Texas when they get talking to me. They're like, you gotta be from Texas. And I'm like, man, I love Texas, but I'm a North Carolina girl. So I had to give that little shout out. But with my position, I was over the community and media relations, and my president asked, we're going to do a philanthropy night. We can choose any cause whatsoever. What do you choose? And so obviously I said Alzheimer's disease. So we did our jerseys in Alzheimer's purple. We had our logo, we had a local organization, McKee Homes, to sponsor where we gave the first 2,000 fans in the stands a free t-shirt that was all purple. This year, in 2021, they'll get a free purple hat, so they'll, you know, kind of have a complete outfit look. But then up there, you see, I actually attended the walk with my best friend, Bunker, the greatest red cobcated woodpecker in the entire world, and we represented our team at our Fayetteville Walk walked in Alzheimer's and we ended up raising during paint the part purple over eight thousand dollars for the North Carolina chapter of the Alzheimer's Association. I always believe that you will receive a blessing if you just put forth the effort. So if you're passionate about something or in an opportunity where you can see that you can be a blessing to someone else that you can raise awareness for Alzheimer's disease I highly encourage it. Again, cannot push this enough for that 24-hour-a-day, seven-day-a-week helpline. So make sure that you have snapped a photo of that if you haven't already because that is incredible because we need you because you are our living, breathing walks in making sure that people know that these resources are available. Now, we get to my favorite portion of the program because like I was sharing with you, I am passionate about music and how... That experience with Miss Rosie sh changed my life. And with music, because music takes the entire brain to process, whether that's through lyrics, whether it's through a rhythm, whether it's through a melody, it can sometimes overcome the disease and be able to provide relief for the patients. So that was what I advocated for while I was Miss North Carolina, was for people to ask and figure out what were some of mom's favorite music growing up? What were some of her favorite songs? And you can put that together on an iPod or either on Alexa, and you can hit, or you can say, Alexa, play mom's playlist. And those songs would be automatically downloaded onto that, and that would provide relief whenever she was feeling anxious, if she was going through a fit or a spell where she didn't understand or she wasn't able to remember everyone. The music calms and sometimes prov provides so much relief. So I highly encourage that to you as well. If you are a caregiver, play some of the music that they love and see what happens. And it truly will be... A wonderful world when we don't have Alzheimer's disease and I think that in situations like today just to be able to gather together again safely is such a blessing 
and it is a wonderful world that we live in. I see trees of green, red roses too. I see them bloom for me and you. And I think to myself, what a wonderful world. I see skies of blue and clouds of white, the bright blessed day and the dark sacred night. And I think to myself, what a wonderful world. The colors of the rainbow, so pretty in the skies, are also on the faces of people going by. I see friends shaking hands, saying, how do you do? But they're really saying, I love you. I hear babies cry. And I watch them grow, they'll learn much more than I'll ever know. And I think to myself, what a wonderful world, yes, I think to myself what a wonderful world I see trees of green I think to myself, what a wonderful world. Thank you so very much. God bless you. I'm here all day. I can't wait to talk to the anchors later. But um, if you guys need me, here's how you can get in touch with me if you don't grab me and hug my neck, which I highly encourage you to do so because I've been missing out on a whole year of hugs and I've got to recap my quota. So if you have questions or anything like that, come up and talk to me. Or you can email me at Huggins for Victoria Alexis Huggins at alz.org. God bless you. Let's end alls together. Thank you, Victoria, for sharing your message. Many of us have family members with this awful disease and we've been affected by it. We appreciate your work and that you're doing with awareness of this disease. On behalf of Pilot International, 
I am proud to present to you honorary membership oh, in Pilot. <laughs> so welcome to Pilot. <laughs> this is like winning Miss North Carolina. There you go. All awesome. right. We to, all, also to show our appreciation, we have a little gift for you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> and a T-shirt, a Pilot T-shirt. So oh, for the convention. So, the oh. Lord. this is wonderful. I will wear it with pride. Well, thank, thank you. you thank so you very for being much. with us. Thank you. <laughs> Our Pilot International Service Project this year is to provide teachers in Macon, Georgia area, school supplies for their classrooms. At this time, I would like to ask two hardworking past presidents, Laura Kiever and Judy Langley, to come forward to present our Pilot International Service Project. Thank you, Madam President. When the 100th Anniversary Committee began talking about a service project for our convention in this coming year, we knew it had to be special. And we looked and we talked and we thought about it and we were getting nowhere. And then one day, Judy and I were working on the 100th Anniversary book and it was like a light bulb came on. We realized that we needed to tie our project this year with the very first project of the Pilot Club of Macon. These pilots helped the schools in Macon get a bond referendum back up for vote that had failed, and of course it passed. When pilots decide to do something, they do it. So we decided our project needed to benefit the schools in Macon, Georgia. The idea was approved by our entire committee and then the executive committee. So we met with Jeremy Timmerman, who is the communication directors of Bibb County, and plans were made to provide school supplies for classrooms. Well, Judy and I went to Office Depot one day in Macon and were looking around trying to decide what should go in the supplies, how we were going to do this, when the manager came up, Mr. Allen, and started talking to us, what are y'all doing pulling all these supplies? Well, after hearing about our project, he offered to purchase the items in bulk for us so we could get much more. They are storing the items after we give them the money to buy them. He is paying for his staff to box them up for us, and they're gonna bring them to headquarters the day we deliver them. So we are very appreciative to Office Depot. <laughs> right. Okay, there's the box. We were hoping to have the two gentlemen with us today, the school district superintendent Dr. Curtis Jones, and also to have uh, James Allen with us, who Laura affectionately calls Steve because she can't remember his name. I don't know why. I don't know why. <laughs> uh, we have found out that unfortunately, uh, James Allen's grandparents were in a tragic accident and he's gone to be with them in Dothan, Alabama. So he couldn't be with us today. We don't know why Dr. Jones is not here. It's Saturday and schools are closed. <laughs> <laughs> we are very proud to say that to date, we have raised $17,947. But I really think we can do better than that. I mean, we could at least get it to 20, couldn't we? Laura and I will accept your checks anytime. Anytime. <laughs> <laughs> but this is the tight box we will have. Got all kinds of, you can't hear me? No, I'm sorry. All kinds of notebooks, 
pencils, pens, markers, glue sticks for the younger children. So just a good variety. We will also be delivering large boxes of copy paper to each school and things like this and Kleenex and things that they need. So. Okay, and please, please know that the executive committee and other pilots look forward to delivering many boxes of school supplies to the Bibb County Schools in August. So we'll have lots of photos and we'll share that mm -hmm. with you on Facebook, on the website too, because you are the ones that made this happen. happen. Yes. We thank these men for being a part and helping us to um, make this project a reality. And thank you. you. Yes, thank you. It's here. Um, the anchors have also worked hard on a project this week. At this time, I would like Susan Woodward, our Director of Youth Development, to come to the podium, or at least in front of the stage, and uh, sh share their project with us. Good morning. Our anchors join forces with the pilots in celebrating the elementary schools in Macon. They have worked very hard this week to create beautiful artwork from plastic bottle caps that were donated by pilots, anchors, many, many clubs across here. We chose pictures that would be fun, colorful, and meaningful to the school's experience. We have Harris Ruffin from this, uh, Mississippi. No, Louisiana. No. Mississippi. Mississippi holding one of the five pieces of artwork that we have made. We had a lot of fun with this special project and hope the receiving schools will enjoy the art for years to come. I dropped in on them and they were having fun and, and hard at work doing this, their project. So thank you, anchors. Also, all the decorations on the table this morning will go to teachers in Macon County. These supplies were donated by the South Carolina pilots. And uh, somebody said, what's, what's, all, what's going on with all the math? Well, that's because I was a high school mathematics teacher and taught a while at the college level. So math is my passion. So that's why the numbers are all over the um, um, poster boards. Um, Laura and Judy put a lot of hard work into planning our pilot service project. Thank you, Laura and Judy, and, and thank you, Susan and the anchors, for your amazing project. The many notebooks, ruler, and pencil at each of your places is my gift to you. Thank you for being here this morning, and please be sure to take them with you. My husband said he does not want to pack them up to go back to South Carolina. <laughs> During a challenging year, pilots found new ways to meet, to raise funds, and to serve their communities. They let pilot be the one to guide them. Through the generosity of pilots, we were able to award 12 matching grants, totaling $24,297. The scholarship committee awarded 39 scholarships, totaling 43,000. Clubs continue to support those who care for others through pick-me-ups. 26 clubs were awarded pick-me-ups for a total of $5,000. Helmet grants were awarded to 10 clubs for a total of $1,200. Your donations to the Goal for Grants and Scholarship Fund allow us to continue serving our communities through matching grants and supporting our future scholars through scholarships. The total raised for Giving Tuesday was $16,350. 
This was the best year yet for Giving Tuesday. We had set a goal of 10,000, so we exceeded that goal by $6,350. Thank you all. This also went to the goal for grants and scholarships this year. We could not do all of this without each of you. Thank you for your donations. You are truly amazing. Our endowment fund assures that Polynesian National can be sustained for another 100 plus years. I'm pleased to announce that we were able to bring the endowment fund to over $1 million this year. <laughs> this has been a goal for many years, many years. <laughs> These funds are invested with Raymond James Inve Investment Bank. The PI Power Hour was added this year. The Power Hour provided training and updates on Pilot International. Topics included member clicks, virtual fundraising, pick-me-ups and helmet grants, matching grants, scholarships, Pilot and Anchor Awards, Brain Minders, District and PI Officer nomination procedures, ordering helmets, and PI convention overview. We were pleased with the success of this PI Power Hour and plan to continue next year. There have been two searches this year for executive director. Each time the executive committee offered the position to a candidate we thought would be a good fit for Pilot International and for our pilots. Unfortunately, these candidates decided not to accept the position. The search will continue. It is important that we find the best fit for our organization. We need someone who will remain with Pilot for several years and help us grow. Pilot International headquarters has had a facelift much work has been done both inside and outside. The 100th Anniversary Committee asked for your help and you responded. Thanks to you, your generosity, the grounds and the, the building have been um, beautified and look great. Many of you saw our beautiful headquarters yesterday. New markers of pilot milestone, milestones have been put in place in the garden. We have a new archives room where pilots can enjoy looking at pilot history and comfort. In the Heritage Library, visitors can look at pilot memorabilia, including a pictorial walk through history. The donor wall in the donor recognition room is amazing. You can see it on the screen. Andy Brinkley, the owner of Andy Brinkley Studios in Connolly Springs, North Carolina, designed the tree sculpture you see on the wall. Andy specializes in sculpture made of brass and copper. The leaves on the tree are copper frames. The names of the donors for each level are in these frames. I know all of you who visited headquarters yesterday agree that the donor wall is breathtaking. We are celebrating 100 years of friendship and service at this convention and will continue to celebrate throughout the 2021 year. While we continue to honor the past, we also envision a future that is bright and promising, a future ensuring that our organization not only exists but also thrives in the next 100 years. Thank you. My, my 2020-2021 governors have asked to be recognized. I'm not sure what they're up to, but at this time, 2020-2021 uh, governors, please come on down.
goodness. <laughs> Aren't we cute? Our mama dressed us alike. <laughs> Simon, the author, Simon Sinek, has a quote that we all agreed on applies to this year. Leadership is not about being in charge. Leadership is about taking care of those in your charge. Thank you, President Peggy, for taking care of us and taking the extra effort to make us feel special even your problem students. <laughs> Thank you for leading by example. Thank you for encouraging new ways to communicate and not blocking our cell phone numbers and our email addresses. <laughs> Thank you for being a true example of grace under pressure. Thank uh, when you wear the gift. Uh, we hope that you remember your accomplishments this year and know that we love you and we are proud to be Peggy's prodigies. shaking, it's hard to open these things. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think you did. Me too. Make my last thing hard. <laughs> oh, and the, all right. Thank you. I love you all. Thank you. <laughs>
What a great group I have had. They have overcome many obstacles this year. But you know, we've learned things that we probably would not have learned had we not had these obstacles. So um, thank you all for your support, for your hard work, for your love, and I love all of you. Judy, are there any announcements? <laughs> okay. We have a lovely black sweater. Please let me know if it's yours. Gary, I don't think it's yours. Huh? Oh, a lovely black sweater. I don't, you got it? C come get it. <laughs> okay, Judy Brotherton, where are you? Okay, Vivian, take this to Judy, it has her name on it. Vivian. <laughs> Judy Brotherton, I think. Somebody lost part of their name tag if you want it, see me. Uh, does anyone know where Doris Locke's glasses are? <laughs> you know, the other day we had a pair of glasses and I said, if they're yours, and somebody came and got the glass and said they're not mine, but they're a friend. The question is, is Doris your friend? <laughs> I don't know, she's looking for glasses. Okay, Debbie Thompson is looking for a black spiral notebook. It, uh, she had it at the newsletter workshop. I have her cell number, and she, you have it? You got it. Thank you so much, thank you, Joyce. We have some other rather um, detailed notes from the Council of Leaders, and I know this person took lots of notes, so I know you want it. I have this. Come and get it. We also found a gift over here on the table after Colette, Vivian, here. <laughs> All right, Pat LaBelle's governors will meet outside the ballroom immediately after breakfast um, for a pilot convention picture. You're gonna love this one. Be sure to sign Deb Hayes' memory book if you've not already done so. Number one, whoever is the person that has the book, bring it to Deb. And number two is good luck finding Deb during the breaks. <laughs> Please be sure to get your 2019-2020 yearbook. It's the commemorative yearbook of Deb. The doorkeepers have them as you exit for this break. Be sure to get you one. You don't have to wear a black t-shirt to get it. And... There was one final one. Be sure to shop at Calcutta. Those uh, sales are ongoing through today. They've gotten a tremendous amount of money, but they'd like to collect some more. Yes. The lady who um, fell the other day, she is doing okay. Just wanted to let you know. And, and it was in the program, but we, we, re, we added a medical team committee this year. So they've been on task with all the medical supplies and everything they need. Thank y'all. I think that's it, President Peggy.
I'm going to give you a break in just a minute, but be before I do, in the mentoring workshop yesterday, we had a wonderful discussion, and many of them thought, thought it would be a good idea to have pilot pals so that we could get to know other pilots in district, different districts and um, different countries and share ideas and communicate and be a pilot pal. So if you would like to have a pilot pal, put your contact information, at least your name and your email, on a piece of paper, and I'm gonna put a bag, I'm gonna put it up here on this table and you for the break, and you can drop your card, if you have a card, business card, that will work, drop it in that bag, and at the end of the second session, you may draw, those of you who put a name in the bag, may draw a name out, and that will be your pilot pal, pal, pal. Excuse me, but if you want to, sh to share in that opportunity, please do so, and the bag will be up here during the break. Let's break until 10:30. See you back at 10:30.